They're not walking in the liberty of the Holy Ghost because in truth, they're not walking in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's sad to say a lot of people today believe that they are. They think that they are. But if you really look at their Christian walk, if you really look at how they do things and how they believe, what they're really doing is they're walking in relationship with the Southern Baptist Convention. They're walking in relationship with the Assemblies of God. They're walking in relationship with the Roman Catholic Church or they're walking in relationship with the Watchtower Bible Society or they're walking in relationship with... Uh, you know, Salt Lake City, Utah. They're not in relationship with Jesus Christ. And without being in relationship with Jesus Christ, you do not have the liberty. And you don't understand the concept of liberty. As long as we walk in relationship with anything but Christ, we're bound. We are still bound. The law is binding. It'll tie you up in knots. How many of us grew up in churches that had us tied up in knots? Hello now. Amen. We had all kind of rules and all kind of regulations. And half of them they tried to construe as something that came from the New Testament. And the other half they construed from the Old Testament. And the funny thing that always cracks me up are these really radical right-wingers who, you know, they, they want to pull a law out of the Old Testament. And they want to say, oh, the Bible said homosexuals were stoned. No, that is not what the Bible says. Not by a stretch, my friend. What the Bible said was if two or three physically witnessed two men engaged in Intercourse. I'm going to talk real plain because I, I don't have time to miss. So if you got a teen watching and you're worried about them, then you might want to change the channel because this preacher don't know how to play games. I talk plain. There was one specific sexual act. One specific sexual act that was prohibited and that is according to the most conservative reading. In other words, Jewish scholars and Jewish uh, scribes and, and uh, rabbis debate this point. But the most conservative of Jewish rabbis believe that there is only one specific act. It had nothing to do with a class of people. Got news for you. You could be gay, you could be a gay male, a homosexual male, and never engage in that one specific act. So to say that the Bible said homosexuals were stoned, that only demonstrates your ignorance. The law of Moses was not, by any stretch of the imagination, vague. It is called the law for a reason. The law was followed to the letter. Jesus said, I've not come to destroy the law, but I've come to fulfill it. There are every single point of the law was specific. If God said you don't eat a certain kind of animal, he wasn't saying you couldn't eat meat. He was saying you could not eat meat from this specific type of animal. Do you follow what I'm saying? If God said you can't eat this certain kind of bird, Martin, he was not saying you could not eat fowl. You couldn't have poultry. That, no, that's not what he was saying. But that is how a lot of people in the church world today love to try to read the Old Testament law and interpret it. Well, it said, man shall not lie down with a man as with a woman. Glory to God. That means anybody who engages in anything. That's not what it says. And even the scholars and scribes and the rabbis 
understand that there is one specific act. And modern rabbis and modern scholars will tell you that that act was only forbidden to, you've got to remember, I've talked about this before, the law was given to the nation of Israel. The law was given, listen carefully, to the nation of Israel. Israel is the only nation in the world that has a government that was written and designed by God himself. There were religious elements mixed in with the law because obviously God's the one who's establishing the law. So there were secular aspects of the law and there were religious aspects of the law. And in the course of the giving of the law, there was also a process that was established by God for the administration of the law. You know, for instance, if somebody doesn't pay a parking ticket, a cop doesn't come to your home and shoot you in the head. If you're lucky. <laughs> Amen. Amen. No, they're not, they're not given that authority. They, a police officer, for that matter, that is not given the authority to uh, determine your guilt or innocence. The police officer can arrest you. He can put you in jail. You then have your day in court. You then have the right to representation. There is a process whereby the law is administered. Am I telling the truth? The same thing is true of God's Old Testament law. There was a process whereby the law was administered. Part of that process was very simple. Any act that was forbidden by the law, including the quote-unquote homosexual act, notice in the law there was never one word said about women. There was no prohibition whatsoever on women in the Old Testament law, not a word. There is one act referred to within the context of Old Testament law. How did they go door to door looking for limp-wristed sissies so they could arrest them and put them through the... No, that is not how it worked. They were supposed to stone adulteresses and adulterers. Did they go door to door looking? If they heard, oh, I heard through the grapevine that Mrs. Jones is having an affair with Mr. Smith. Let's go see. Let's go sneak up on them and see if we can catch them. No, that was not legal. According to God's law, that was not acceptable. The only time any of these acts would result in the death penalty or a severe penalty of any nature is if they were committed in such a way and in such a place as to allow for two or more, two or three at least, minimum, witnesses to physically see the act taking place. This is one reason why in the Ten Commandments God said, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Why? Because it's very important that you don't have two people who just get in together and say, well, we're going to accuse so-and-so. You know, we saw them doing such and such. No, if you were found to be bearing false witness, guess what? You were subject to a very severe penalty as well because a false witness was considered a very severe crime. All right, so no. In the Old Testament, there were not gay men that were just tossed out in the street and stoned. Did you know, according to the law of Moses, even a confession was not sufficient for the penalty? It means a homosexual man who just had sex with another man could walk out in the middle of the street, literally, and say, I just had sex with another man. Couldn't do a thing about it. Could not do one thing about it. A confession was not even sufficient. There had to be two or three physical witnesses to the act. This is why 
the woman who was caught in the quote unquote in the very act of adultery was carried before Jesus and they said this woman was caught in the very act of adultery and the law says that she must be stoned, right? You remember that? Well, obviously, there must have been two or three witnesses who physically caught her. Now, you know there are people in our world today who do some pretty stupid things in some pretty stupid places. Let's say, for instance, Mr. Smith and Mrs. Jones decided they were going to have a little rendezvous in the back of their Packard out at Lake Tawakalaki, wherever that may be. And it just so happens that Susie and Johnny, devout Jews, happen to walk past their car and they happen to peek in and they say, oh my goodness, I see Mr. Smith and I see Mrs. Jones and both of them are married and not to one another. Then they could bring charges. Then they could, do you follow what I'm saying? So in other words, as long as you kept your inappropriate conduct by reason of the law, as long as you kept it private, it was your business, it was between you and God, period. You understand? That's pretty simple, isn't it? It was between you and God. The Jewish faith to this day does not bar gay and lesbian people from the synagogues. They do not stand at the door of a synagogue. They look at Christians. I've read, uh, I've done a lot of research in this field because it was of interest to me. I wanted to understand the Jewish mindset on the issue of homosexuality and what have you. And the Jewish faith looks at it very practically and they say we all break Torah. Meaning we all offend God. We all do things that are contrary to the law. And therefore, for us to stand at the door of the synagogue and say to the gay or lesbian person, no, you're not welcome in the synagogue. You're not welcome as part of the religious community of the of, uh, Jewish faith. They said it would be stupid because we all sin. We all fall short. Well, isn't, isn't that the very thing the Bible tells us? In the New Testament, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So nobody should be standing at the door. But see, this is all built on that idiotic notion that homosexuality is somehow this horrible, gross, hideous sin. Guess where that notion came from? The Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, like its predecessor in Babylon, is obsessed with the notion of procreation. Yeah. That is why for centuries the Catholic Church has forbid any form of birth control. My grandmother was Roman Catholic uh, until she came to the Lord after she married my grandfather at about 18. Uh, and my grandmother said, you know, even the rhythm method was considered inappropriate and inexcusable. You were not even supposed to count your days and, you know, do the math to determine when you were least fertile, when you were most fertile. You weren't even permitted to do that yep. because they were obsessed, Martin, with procreation. Therefore, anything, any sexual act that doesn't result in procreation, the Roman Catholic Church was vehemently against. Obviously, gay relationships, lesbian relationships were very offensive to them, and they began to label it unnatural. And they tried to go to Paul saying in the book of Romans how that they left their natural affections. Well, that would be fine if it were true for everyone that it was not natural to them. No, there are people even today who leave their natural affections to engage in act, uh, sexual acts that are not natural to them. You say, well, pastor, that didn't make any sense. Um, go to a prison. Homosexual sex 
Notice I said homosexual sex because sex and being a homosexual are not the same thing. You can engage in a homosexual act that does not make you a homosexual. You can do something that is gay and that doesn't make you gay. Men in prison who's there for 30 years and has no recourse, has no option, has no opportunity to be visited by his gal will leave his natural affections, and I tell him the truth, so that he can do something that is not natural to him. But he does it, why? Strictly in response to lust. He's got to work off his energies. He's got, so he finds a way, whether he is, you know, daydreaming in his head about, you know, his girl or what he has to do in order to accomplish. And somebody said, well, that's ridiculous. No, it's not, honey. I got news for you. A lot of gay men do that and have babies with women that way. Oh, pastor, did you really say that? Yes, I did. Because they have to kind of imagine something that, that is more natural to them. Something that they that they are more inclined to enjoy and, and pursue. So, yeah, it, it's very possible that you can engage in an act that is not natural to you. When Paul said in Romans 1 that they burned in their lusts and they left that which was natural, he was not saying that heterosexuality alone is natural. He was saying that these people left what was natural for them to engage in homosexual acts. Do you follow what I'm saying? All right. So, we understand a little bit better the concept of law. We understand Jesus Christ came to set us free, to put us at liberty, not only from sin and unbelief, but also from the law. So let's move on then in our study. Last week, we began... Let me see, I want to make sure I'm at the right spot here. All right. 1 Corinthians... Chapter... I've got to move us one page ahead here. That's Galatians. Two. Five. I think I might have my pages grouped up, so maybe I better read from the screen because I know I've got those right. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 25, the Apostle Paul writes, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Paul is writing to the Galatian church concerning the law, because there are certain Jews who are trying to convince, and to this day there are, I keep wanting to put my glasses here, forgetting the mics there. Uh, to this day there are Jews who are trying everything in their power to convince Christians that they must become subject to the law. I've seen it, I've heard it, I've seen it on YouTube. They try to convince you, you know, well, Jesus said, I've not come to destroy the law. He didn't come to destroy. No, he didn't, but he came to fulfill it. And when you fulfill a contract, that contract is no longer valid. It's no longer binding. 
And the truth of the matter is the law was meant to only serve up until the resurrection. Not until the death of Jesus on the cross. Salvation was not made fully complete until the resurrection. Nobody left the bowels of hell in that little place of waiting, that place of holding where the Jews would go that is referred in Scripture to Abraham's bosom. Nobody left that place when Jesus died on the cross. But they left it when? They left it when he arose from the dead. The Bible said he led captivity captive. He released those that were in captivity. He opened the cage and let them out when he resurrected. There is no salvation without an acknowledgement and a faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you cannot believe that he died and be saved. You've got to believe in your heart that he rose from the dead. Do you follow? All right. So now we understand Paul has... Uh, Jews in the Galatian church trying to convince the Gentile believers that they too must embrace at least a part of the law. That part which they deem the most uh, important. Well, for men in the Hebrew faith, the most important thing you can do uh, it, it, as far as Judaism is concerned, you must be circumcised as a physical evidence to your uh, faith and you're following after the God of Abraham. It was not commonly practiced to circumcise at that time. And in order to be a Jew, in order to be part of the Jewish faith, you had to be circumcised. So you had a lot of Christians, mind you. These were Christians. They were Christ followers, but they were Jewish. And they're telling the Gentile converts, you must embrace at least this one point of the law, you must be circumcised. Paul says to those people, look at how he starts, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. He said, don't you move a muscle from that place of liberty. So don't you, you stand fast in that liberty. Don't you let anybody pull you back. Don't you let anybody put you back in bondage. Oh, I wish LGBT believers would hear what I'm talking about today. Don't you let anybody pull you back into the bondage. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. The law, I don't care how much T.D. Jakes, I don't care how much... Uh, Rod Parsley, I don't care how much Jimmy Swaggart, I don't care how much any of these preachers quote the law. It is non-binding. First of all, it was not given to you. It was given to the Jewish nation, number one. If you understand that, that should solve all our problems right there. The problem is we have people in the church who try to represent the law as though the law has any relationship to the church of the New Testament whatsoever. The law has no relationship, none, to the New Testament church. The law. The first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, has no relationship whatsoever to New Testament believers. The Bible said it is for us, it is types and shadows of things to come. So what we see in the law are merely representations of things that we've come to understand in the New Testament. For instance, when you look at the Passover 
uh, Seder. When you look at the ritual that is practiced by the Jewish people uh, at Passover, the entire religious ritual, the, the entire Seder, speaks of and represents the Lord Jesus Christ. The entire thing. Start, they don't realize it. <laughs> they don't realize what they're doing. They take a piece of bread and they break it into three pieces and they take the center piece and they wrap it in cloth and they hide it for three days. And after three days, they go get that bread and they take it out and they unwrap it and they don't realize they have just buried the bread of life. Hallelujah! They just buried... Jesus said, I am the bread which come down from heaven. Hallelujah. He said on the, on the uh, Passover of the Last Supper, he said, take, eat, this is my flesh, which is given for you. That bread represents his body. They're taking a part of that bread and they're burying it. Well, why aren't they burying the whole thing? Well, it's easy because you can bury a body, but you can't bury a spirit and you can't bury a soul. Well, there are three aspects of a human being, body, soul, and spirit. So they, you can't bury all three of them. You can only bury one of them. So they bury that third portion, which represents, it's not the Trinity, don't have nothing to do with the Trinity. The Bible said God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So that divine nature in the man Jesus Christ went into the grave just as much as any part of his nature that was human went into the grave. Uh, but they bury that one-third representing the body. Three days later, they go dig it out. Do you follow what I'm saying? Every part of the Seder, every part of it, represents the Lord Jesus Christ. So, even though we are not required by God to celebrate Passover, We still can learn from Passover. We still can understand a principle. We can understand concepts. It's a type and shadow. Do you follow what I'm saying? All right? So it's not that the law is disposable because, well, it has no value. No, it has value. The Bible said the law was our school teacher. The law was our instructor. But when you get to Christ, you've graduated. Well, once you've graduated, you no longer have a teacher. I was thinking the other day, I, I guess I was watching an episode of a TV show. Y'all know I love uh, The Middle. And, and I was watching Brick or whoever it is, you know, going to school and all. And I thought to myself, I thought, Lord, oh, I remember those days, you know, when you went to school and you had teachers and some of them you liked and some of them you didn't like. And, and then I thought and I literally, and I said to myself, I said, my Lord, how many years has it been since I had a teacher? When you graduate, you no longer have a teacher. You no longer need a teacher. You've learned what you were meant to learn, supposedly. <laughs> and you were certified and you were given a diploma saying that you had achieved a certain level of learning and a certain level of understanding. Once you get to that point and they hand you that little paper, you move on in life. You move on. You, look, you move beyond that. The same thing is true of the law. Once Jesus Christ came, we graduate. And we no longer have a teacher. That is why Paul said, that you have no need that any man teach you, but the anointing which you have received of God will teach you all things. Said for that, for because that anointing is the Spirit of God, and that is truth. And the Spirit of God will lead you into all truth. You don't need a human being because God will teach you. Once you graduate, the law is unnecessary. You no longer need that schooling because now you're walking what? in relationship with God. And when you walk in relationship with God, He'll teach you. He'll teach you whatever you need to know in the process of your journey. So Paul continues and says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, there it is, 
that if ye be circumcised, this wire keeps, if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. That's a strong statement. He said, if you allow yourself to become subject to this single point of the law, you have just nullified everything that Christ has done for you. Wow. He continues and says, for I testify again. So obviously he said this before. To every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christian, listen to me. I am all, I'm going to tell you what Paul said. The minute you look at one single point in the law, and you deem that point necessary to your salvation, and you embrace that point, you have just shut off grace and made yourself liable to embrace and fulfill the entire law. You'd better worship on the Sabbath. You'd better rest. You better not travel on the Sabbath. You better not go more than three quarters of a mile walking, mind you, because you can't drive because that's considered work. Uh, you better not flip on a light switch. You better not cook. Better not clean the house. Better not go to the beach. Oh, well, that, those are simple things, aren't they? Yeah. And every one of them, according to the law, is not permissible. That's why the Jewish people, Martin, if they want a light on Saturday, they have to turn it on before sundown Friday night, literally, and leave that light on. They cannot flip a light switch. Do you know why most synagogues and uh, temples, Jewish temples and synagogues, do not use music? Because it is considered work for the musician. They consider that work. And they say, if the musician's string should break on his guitar, he'd have to fix it. If he fixes the string, he has just worked. That's how severely uh, they approach the law. That is how deeply specific they approach the law. Okay? So, Paul said, Christ is nothing to you. He, he, he shall profit you nothing, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, listen, ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the Hope of righteousness. Oh my goodness. What are you talking about, Pastor? We're supposed to be walking around with our hair piled on our head. We're supposed to be walking around looking a certain way so that we can be righteous in this world. Uh, sweetheart, apparently you haven't read your Bible. All our righteousness is before the Lord is filthy rags. You can wear your hair as long as you want to wear your hair. That doesn't impress God one iota. That means absolutely nothing to God. Nothing. Hello? You can follow all the rules. You can follow all the regulations. You can embrace all the dogma you want to. You can create as many laws as you want to. None of those things have any bearing on your salvation whatsoever. Ever. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. My God, how much simpler can you get it? I can't word it any simpler than what Paul said. He continues in verse 5. For we through the Spirit wait. What does that mean, Martin? That means we haven't got it yet. 
Paul said in one place, not as though I had already attained. He said, I'm not standing here telling you that I've already attained righteousness, that I've already attained holiness. No, the Bible said, follow after peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. You can't see God who is holy unless you're looking for holiness. Make sense? If you're, if, if you're a police detective <laughs> and your job is to find crime, and your job's to dig out criminals, then you're not going to find very many criminals if all you do is spend all your time at the beach. No, you've got to go where there's evidence that a crime has been committed. Then you've got to dig out all the evidence and try to find the, the criminal who committed the crime. I tell the truth. Well, follow peace with all men, and holiness means you pursue it, you try that, you strive for that. That is your ultimate goal. That is your ultimate end is to live peaceably with all men. Well, I got news for you. There are some people, I don't care how sweet and nice you are, they're not going to let you live peaceably with them. I got a neighbor that's an example of that. I don't care what I do. I've tried to do nice things for her. Her husband's lovely. We get along beautiful, but she just a crappy old thing, you know, find fault with everything. And... It, it doesn't matter how you do her. She's going to crab and groan and moan. But the Bible said, follow peace. So what does that mean, Martin? If I fail in my endeavor to be at peace with all people, and it's their fault, it's not mine, that I have failed? No. But I'm pursuing that, aren't I? Regardless of her actions, I'm pursuing it. Regardless of whether I fail, I'm pursuing holiness. Regardless of whether I fall, I'm pursuing holiness. Regardless of whether I sin, I'm pursuing holiness. I'm not giving myself license to live a life of unbelief and sin, uh, which is completely devoid of faith, and saying, well, in the end, I'll be saved anyway because God loves everybody, and it don't matter how I live, it doesn't matter how I do, no. By faith, we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did wrong well, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth. What is the truth? The truth is, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. That is the truth. Verse 8. This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. Said, honey, I got news for you. Somebody trying to convince you you're supposed to embrace the law and you're supposed to honor the law and live up to this point of the law. He said, that didn't come from the Lord. Verse 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Said, so you want to ruin something? You don't, you don't need a whole lot to ruin something. Just a little bit is, is able to do a whole lot of damage. Just one little issue of the law and letting that issue come in and rob you of your liberty wherein Christ hath made you free, it ruins everything. It doesn't have to be a lot. Doesn't have to be 38 points of the law. It just has to be one. Verse 10. I have confidence in you through the Lord that ye will be none otherwise minded. But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whoever he be. So Paul is saying. The guy that's trying to convince you that you're supposed to embrace the law and you've got to live, you know, you've got to uh, be circumcised, that guy's going to be judged. He said, God's going to judge that man. Verse 11, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Ah, what's got the Jewish law people in such an uproar? The cross. <laughs> it offends them. Why does it offend them? Because the cross is the pen that signed the contract. 
when Jesus declared it is finished, hallelujah, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain, that veil being rent in twain, that veil being ripped literally represented God taking the Old Testament law and tearing it in half and letting it fall to the floor. That's what it literally represented. The thing that stood between God, man and the Holy of Holies no longer stood between man and the Holy of Holies. God himself removed it. God himself tore it. When did he tear it? When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. There is no more separation. Well, this message is an offense to the Jews. Because it says that the law now is complete. Not that it's, not that it's merely thrown away, but that it has been fully satisfied. The law was not meant to be an eternal document. It was meant to be fulfilled. And it was fulfilled in Christ. He continues. Verse 12. I would they were cut. They were even cut off. Which trouble you. For brethren ye have been called. Unto liberty. Only. Listen. Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but to, by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word or in one saying, even in this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So Paul said, brethren, you've been called unto liberty. But that liberty does not mean then that you can use that liberty to just do any old thing you want to do any old way you want to do it. He said, don't, don't allow it to, uh, as an occasion to the flesh. You know, don't let this be something. Don't think that your liberty means you can just go out there and do anything. No. Let it be, all right, God, Christ has set me free from the law. Now I can love people and I can serve people and I can benefit one another and we can work together and we can pursue this without this heavy weight of you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this this way, you got to do that. You can't work on Sunday or, or on Saturday. You can't do, you know what I'm saying? All these things, which if you think about it, if you look at the way a poor a law-abiding Jewish person has to live, my God, they're under an awful weight. I remember one time I, I was doing business with a Jewish fellow, and he and his wife were my landlords in New York City, and to be frank, they were trying to do me real dirty. I was in a, a rent-controlled apartment, and the roommate that I, the person I moved to New York to help was a friend of mine. He was very sick. And he just got worse. And I had been there for, oh, about a year or so. And he decided he was going to go be with his family because, honestly, he was getting, he didn't have AIDS. He had a form of muscular dystrophy. But anyway, he decided he was going to move to his, uh, to be with his family in Puerto Rico. And when he did, I just kept living in the apartment that he and I shared. Now, we had two bedrooms. I, we had our own bedrooms and all that. And... Uh, the landlady was just thrilled to death that he left because if they could get rid of me, that gave them an opportunity to raise the rent. See, if somebody breaks a lease in New York and it's rent controlled, then that breaking of the lease allows the landlord to raise rent. Well, there are very few occasions where a landlord's able to raise rent on a rent controlled apartment. That's why some people have apartments there they've had for 30 years and they're only paying $400 a month. And that very same, which is really crazy when you think about it, and that same apartment, if you were to try to rent that apartment uh, in another building that was not rent controlled, it would cost you $4,000, literally, a month. Okay? So landlords, they love to take advantage of every opportunity they can get to, to boost the rent up a little bit. Because when somebody breaks the lease, they're allowed to raise it like 15% or something like that. And then every tenant thereafter pays that higher price, you see. And then every time somebody breaks a lease again, you're able to do the same thing. Well, she came to my house and told me very devout Hasidic Jews. 
came to my house and told me, well, you know, uh, he's moved and uh, you need to move now. I said, well, ma'am, uh, no, we took this apartment together. Yeah, but you weren't here when he signed the lease. I said, yeah, but you knew good and well when we took it. The only reason we took a two-bedroom was because I had come from Connecticut to help him. And you knew that. Yeah, but you didn't sign the lease. Well, I was working the day. And she actually, that was a whole other little sneaky thing she pulled. Uh, telling him, oh, it's fine. I know he's, he's here, blah, 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 blah. You know, trying to, it, that's how she passed it off on him and he therefore went along with it and signed the lease without me being there. Well anyway, long story short, uh, I wasn't about to move. I didn't have the money to move. New York, my God, you, you can't even imagine how much it costs to move in New York City. And uh, I didn't have money to go find a new apartment and all that, you know, and pay uh, all the fees and application and d deposit and then uh, pay movers and do all that. Well, of course, she took me to court. The judge was not happy. He saw right through her. He knew exactly what she was doing. And he asked me, he said, are you prepared to pay the rent? I said, yes, sir. He said, can you afford to move? I said, no, sir. He said, okay, you got six months. Live there free for six months. You got six months. He said, after six months, come see me and we'll see whether or not you're able to afford to move after six months. After six months, I come back to court. He said, are you prepared to pay the rent? I said, yes, sir. I was, I was ready to pay her the rent the whole time. I had no problem paying the rent. He said, uh, can you afford to move? I said, sir, I really can. He said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to give you another two months. And he said, but what I'm going to do is this. He said, by the end of that two months, I, I want you to move. But how much do you need to move? Now, this is back in late 80s, uh, early 90s, uh, very beginning of the 90s. I said, well, probably about $500. He said, okay. He said, she's going to pay that. He said, you're going to have two months more free rent, eight months rent I got free, all because she wouldn't let me pay the rent. Any advantage she's getting on a rent control apartment, she just blew it for the next 25 years, literally, you know. So anyway, uh, he said she's going to pay you then for the moving costs. Well, of course, she and her lawyer didn't like that very well. Well, no, uh, we'll give it to him after he moves. The judge said, no, you won't. said, how's the man going to move if you give it to him after he moves? That don't make any sense. He said, I'll tell you what I'll do. You give him half right now, and then when he moves, you give him the other half. Okay, oh, she was mad as a hornet. Now, the first day in court, she looked at me and said, no offense, it's strictly business. It's just business. You know. And she mad as a hornet. She gave me the two hundred fifty dollars. I said, "Man, there's." I'm, I hate to say this, folks, but I was not in church at this time, so I, I was not necessarily the nicest person on the planet at the moment. And I looked at her. I said, "No offense, strictly business." It's my way of saying, "You won't play. We'll play. Hey, don't bother me. No way." I was an ugly person when I was out of the church. I'm gonna tell you. Well, I got all moved. I had my U-Haul packed up the second time, ready to go, and I called her and I said, okay, I'm sitting here in front of the apartment, I'm ready for that second $250, you can look and see, the apartment's empty. She said, well, my husband cannot come now because it's going to be sundown in an hour and he won't have time to get there and come back within the hour. I said, ma'am, that don't bother me, no way. That doesn't mean nothing to me. Well, we, we can just give it to you tomorrow or Monday or whatever. I said, no, ma'am, you will not. No, the judge said that as soon as I vacated the apartment and it was empty and you verified it was empty, that I was to get, well, but I can't because my husband will have to break Torah to do. I said, ma'am, I was prepared to pay you the rent from the very first day. 
you're the one who insisted on going down this road, okay? I don't give a flying fig about your religion. I don't give a flying fig about your Sabbath. I don't give a flying fig about your law. All I know is if you're not here in the next 30 minutes to give me my second $250, I am going to empty this truck and I'm going to put everything in it right back in that apartment. And then we'll go back to the judge and I'll tell him. Well, her husband found his way over there. He was mad as a hornet. Oh, was he mad. Folks, what I'm trying to get at is, look at the constraints these people are trying to live under. Look at the constraints they're trying to operate under, okay? Everything they do, every little thing, they've got something that regulates. Christ has set us free. He hasn't set us free to go out whoring. He hasn't set us free to go out drinking. He hasn't set us free to go out drugging. He hasn't set us free to go out and prostitute ourselves. But he has set us free to function in this life without the baggage of the law on our back. Amen. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Amen. Our righteousness is not in our Actions. It is not in our living up to some code or some set of rules. Our righteousness is achieved by faith. Because I'm hoping for it. <laughs> I'm hoping. Why am I hoping? Because I honestly believe it's coming. If you're on a sinking ship... And you wind up in a lifeboat and you're out there in the water floating around. Everything seems hopeless. All of a sudden, off in the distance, you see another ship. And you shoot your flare gun. And you see that ship blink a light a time or two. You say, okay, I see that they've seen me. Now... I have hope. <laughs> Hallelujah. That ship may be 10 miles away. I don't have hope because they're hoisting me up in the boat. No, I have hope because I believe with everything in me that it's coming. I can see it. Hallelujah. I believe in my mind. I believe in my heart that the help I need is on its way. I believe in my heart that Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. I believe in my heart that one day God is going to clothe me in reality in a robe of righteousness that will never, never, never fade. Hallelujah. And that I will be in reality everything he ever wanted for me to be. I believe that, so I hope for it. I'm looking for Jesus to come because I believe he's coming. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. That is what Paul said. Ooh, I'm going to tell you, I wish to God I could set a Pentecostal fire under some of you folks so we could have us a good old-fashioned shouting session. This is good news. Talk about gospel being good news. This is good news. Our righteousness is not wrapped up in our ability to live up to some quote-unquote standard. Does that mean we don't have a standard? No. We have a standard, but that standard is not law. It is not dogma. That standard is based on our relationship with Christ. I'm in relationship with Tommy. Therefore, there are things I don't do. There are places I won't go. There are certain things I won't do certain ways. You say, what do you mean certain things you won't do? In other words, I don't go out alone if generally in uh, Oak Lawn. Now, am I going to be struck dead if I do? If, I happen, if I'm driving Lyft and I happen to get hungry and I decide well, I'm going to stop at Hunkies and have a hamburger, have I ever done it? Yeah, I've done it a time or two. But as a rule, I don't do it. Why do I not do it? Because Tommy has said, don't you dare do it. No. No. He doesn't have to say it. 
I don't want somebody seeing me there and making the false accusation. Oh, I saw the preacher there just, he was just, uh, what do they call it? I can't even think of the word. Cruising, you know. He was just cruising. Boy, he was just flirting around and talking. And I've, I've said some of the most innocuous things to people online. Trying to be, you, and everybody that knows me knows I'm complimentary. I believe in complimenting. I believe in saying positive things. That is something I believe very strongly in. I try to encourage people. I try to say, and I've said things like online, somebody's wearing a, a Halloween costume. Now it kind of might be on the quote-unquote sexy side or whatever, you know? And I'll say, boy, that's nice, you know. Well, you look really nice. That, that's creative or whatever. All of a sudden, I get some big thing come along. Oh, look at you calling yourself a preacher trying to come on to this man. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> Martin, not one word I said. Can that man say that I have ever private messaged him? No, because guess what? There's something else I don't do. You try to private message me on Facebook, you're going to get a response from me that says, I'm sorry, I do not I am. If you want to communicate with me, feel free to send me a complete message, and I will respond to that message. But do not try to enter into small talk. Because generally, to be honest with you, what I have found, Martin, is that when people try to chat me up online, they're either going to start asking me for money or they're going to start looking for something else. So I tell them, I have a little message I cut and paste. It says, for a number of reasons, I do not chat online, blah, blah, blah. Please send me a complete message. I'll be happy to respond. Now, if somebody sends me a message that's off color, ask Tommy if I don't show him that message. Ask him if I don't show him my response. Again, Am I bound by some rule that I cannot talk to people online? No, I'm not bound by a rule. Am I bound by some rule that I have to show Tommy inappropriate messages that come to me? No, I'm not bound by a rule. But I do that out of love and respect for him. Do you follow what I'm saying? I do it out of respect for my relationship. So the godly things we do, the good things we do to, the way we live our lives as Christians, Martin, trying not to uh, engage in drunkenness, not to be high, not to whore around, you know, all these sorts of things. I just ruined your whole day. <laughs> uh, but, you know, these things, I'm not doing these things because I'm forbidden from doing these things per se. It is more because I love the Lord. And he has called me, and I'm done for this week. He has called me to be a testimony and a witness. He has called me to be a light in a dark world. And if I live my life no different than those who are outside of the faith, where's the light? No. Life, excuse me, light contrasts with light, and it contrasts so severely that where there is light, darkness cannot abide. So the world that the Bible says is in darkness is in a very different place than I am. Yeah, I live my life different. Yeah, I follow different rules. I do things a different way. Am I mandated? Is it because God will send you to hell if you don't <laughs> glory to God? No, it's not because God will send me to hell. It's because I love the Lord. Right. And I want to be a witness. I want to be a testimony. Amen. Are you getting...